Hello, everyone. My name is Joe Hurd, and on behalf of Harvard Alumni Entrepreneurs and our amazing panelists, I'm happy to welcome you to our 2020 Advancing Diversity Black Entrepreneurship Series. Harvard Alumni Entrepreneurs, better known as HAE, is a global community with 15 chapters worldwide, connecting over 14,000 Harvard alumni through entrepreneurship and innovation. You can join by registering at www.harvardae.org. First, as we begin today's program, I'd like to thank our amazing sponsors. Arcturus Impact Advisors, Investors, Fortis Lux Financial, the Harvard Business School Association of Boston, the Harvard Club of Boston, Morse, On River HR, SAP.io Foundries, Saul Ewing Arnstein and Lair LLP, and Sophia. Okay, let's start the show. So over the past month, Jill Johnson, who's part of our panel today, and Regina Ryan, president of Harvard Alumni Entrepreneurs, helped by a host of other people, such as Nicole Roselman, Daniela Garcia, and Annabelle Baxter, have put together a four-part program using HAE's platform to start a necessary conversation by highlighting the challenges faced by Black entrepreneurs, by recognizing how bias challenges every aspect of the Black entrepreneurial journey, and by pointing out how investors, founders, and companies can be catalysts for change. On November 16th, Jill moderated a panel discussing the historical perspective behind Black entrepreneurship in America. Then on September 23rd, Tracy Ty Moore moderated a panel exploring the Black entrepreneur experience titled Walking the Walk. With today's third session, we're going to focus on solutions for funding Black entrepreneurs and helping them overcome the wealth gap. After today's conversation in six months, we'll reconvene to examine what, if anything, has changed. Before we get to our wonderful panelists, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping items for those of you following us on screen. First is, in terms of format, we're going to spend about an hour together with taking questions for the panelists for the first 40 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to an audience Q&A for the last 20 minutes. If you would like to submit questions during the discussion, please feel free to post them in the chat room and Regina or one of her team members will collate the questions and save them for our Q&A. In addition, Regina's team have prepared a helpful toolkit containing panelists' bios, reading information, and a contact list that will be sent out after today's panel. Most importantly, there'll be a survey, which we'd appreciate you taking the time to fill out. Thanks in advance for that. And then finally, to make it easy for everyone to follow this conversation, I'd like for everybody except the panelists to turn their video off and be sure to mute yourselves. So if you wouldn't mind turning your videos off now, it'll make it much easier to follow the conversation with the panelists. Okay, turning to the, turning to the meet. We're honored to have four talented black investors who are going to help us better understand the structural inequities that affect access to capital, the fundraising process, and steps that the investor community should be taking to overcome the wealth gap. Let me briefly introduce each one of them. First, we have Jill Johnson. Jill is the co-founder and CEO of the Institute for Entrepreneurial Leadership, which was founded in 2002. IFEL is an independent nonprofit organization that supports economic development through entrepreneurship. She received her undergraduate degree from Harvard University, and she's based in New Jersey. Next up, we have Kimberly Marshall. Kimberly is an angel investor and advisor who works with Goldman Sachs on their launch with GS investing strategy. She's also a founding board member of Black Angels Miami. Kimberly earned her undergraduate degree from Harvard University as well, and an MBA from Northwestern. Kimberly's based in Miami. Welcome, Kimberly. Third, we have Jared Tingle, and Jared is the co-founder and managing partner of Harlem Capital a $40 million venture capital fund that's on a mission to change the face of entrepreneurship by investing in 1,000 women and minority founders over the next 20 years. That's quite an ambitious goal. He received his MBA from Harvard Business School where he was a Baker Scholar and he's based in New York City. Welcome, Jared. And finally, we have Greg Campbell. Greg Campbell is the president and CEO of Rainmaker Incorporated, a strategic investment and advisory firm and he's also the managing partner of Medangini, 
a healthcare-focused venture capital fund. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree from Cornell University and, like Jared, an MBA from Harvard Business School. Greg's based in Texas. To all four of our panelists, thank you very much for joining us today. Okay, the title of this session is Overcoming the Wealth Gap. And before we get into the conversation, I wanted to just present for our audience a few statistics on what the wealth gap really means for black entrepreneurs in the United States. Point one, black founders receive less than 1% of venture capital dollars invested in the US. Point two, in 2018, more than 9,000 companies were funded. Only 227 of those were founded by black founders. When we talk about asset management, less than 1.3% of the $69 trillion of global financial assets under management are managed by women and people of color. But those funds led by women minorities are overrepresented in the top quartile of private equity funds. And then finally, in 2017, according to Transparent Collective, a nonprofit that's focused on providing access and resources to underrepresented founders, male founders overall raised $66 billion. Female founders raised $1.9 billion. And black women raised, wait for it, $250 million. In fact, there's only 50 black women that have raised more than 1 million for their companies. So as we think about these facts and as we listen to the panelists, I have two assignments for each of you watching us today. In true Harvard fashion, you're not going to get away without homework. The first is, by the end of the panel, I'd like each of you to understand clearly what each of our panelists does, how they fit in the overall ecosystem, and most importantly, think about ways that you can help. And then second, I'd like you to think about the actions that you can take after we wrap. You might consider becoming a mentor, signing up for a newsletter distribution list, researching some of the fantastic funds and companies that you'll hear about, or perhaps becoming an investor yourself. But I'd like you to take action. That's what this conversation is all about. So let's start with Jill Johnson. Jill, you're first up. You can introduce yourself far better than I ever could. Why don't you take two minutes to tell us the story behind the bio, what you do day to day, and how you fit into the Black investor ecosystem? Sure. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, great introduction. I mean, when you just hear those facts, um, it's very clear that we have to do something and there's just no way that anyone can be a bystander. Um, so my journey started actually uh, when I was younger with my parents having a business and that's what I grew up seeing. I grew up seeing them um, in their business day to day and they were small business owners. They had a newspaper publishing company. My parents had that company for about 20 years. And um, I thought of it as again, source of income and that was like their job where they went every day. It wasn't until I worked at Goldman Sachs, I started my career in the financial analyst program and mergers and acquisitions that I saw a much different slice of life where, you know, in that world and m and <laughs> you see people who start businesses, they scale them and they're exiting for mega dollars. That was not something that I had heard my parents ever talk about. Um, they had never talked about really building wealth from their business. It was all about really self-employment. And that's what we hear just too often from black entrepreneurs, but you don't know what you don't know. So if you're not, if you don't have that sort of exposure, um, you just don't know. And that was really the motivation for launching the Institute for Entrepreneurial Leadership um, was to help more black entrepreneurs to think differently about their business, about the purpose of their business and about how they actually create value and then extract that value from their business. Um, I feel right now my role um, is really one as a facilitator. Um, it is to create awareness, to be a champion uh, for Black entrepreneurs and really about for, for Black wealth creation in general. Um, and that is a mantle that I um, take up, that I hold up. Um, and and it, it's a challenge, but I really believe that if we work together and if we get allies involved, that we can make a difference. That's fantastic. So. Let me return to one of the points I raised earlier, talking specifically about, about black women and their access to capital, right? 
with only 50 black women in the US raising more than a million dollars. Is there a specific set of challenges for black women you think that merits special attention as we focus on that entrepreneur group? Oh, that is loaded. Absolutely it requires special attention. <laughs> There's just no way that you can hear that statistic, especially when black women are starting businesses at a faster rate than anybody else. Um, so it absolutely requires special attention. But I think that we also have to be very clear on some of the challenges. We're not just dealing with, as black women, um, the, the black issue. We're also dealing with the woman issue. So we have the double whammy. And often we are um, overlooked. Um, we are not thought of um, as people who can participate in uh, the, the economic equation. Uh, we are not really thought of as capitalists. Um, and it's really, um, uh, it, it, it's disheartening to see that this is something that isn't recognized, that, that there is a serious problem here and that we have to address it. But we have to address it from the unique needs of Black women. We do not fit neatly into the woman box. So even women's initiatives do not often address our needs. And it doesn't even fit into just the black entrepreneur box where again, women can often get overlooked. So what you're, what you're describing is really a systemic issue, right? If black women in particular have a specific, specific set of needs that they're uh, discounted and undervalued as entrepreneurs you know, and as, 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 uh, as professionals, what are some of the solutions here? Is it looking at the pipeline of people making the investment decisions? Is it special funds and monies reserved, allocated specifically for this in in entrepreneur class? What are some of the fixes here in your view? Yeah, well, one if of you the- you had a magic wand. Yeah, <laughs> well, one of the major fixes is really at the earliest level. Again, while we often will uh, talk about the numbers at the VC level, really all that starts at the very earliest levels of personal savings and friends and family. If you don't have friends and family money in that early stage capital, how would you ever even get on the VC path? That's, it's a continuum really. And so we really have to look at um, how we address uh, what doesn't exist as friends and family money. And I think, again, this is where um, allies in the investor ecosystem can get involved um, in especially looking to support black women founders and entrepreneurs um, as angel investors, um, looking at how to get involved in these companies. And we cannot continue just you know business as usual. Um, there has to be a different lens. That different lens, meaning not that we don't expect that these businesses can produce a return, but where we look and say, well, the proxy of your traction is not how much friends and family money have you raised to date. Because if you don't have friends and family who have that kind of capital, then you're not going to be able to get there. So um, really for me, if I had a magic wand, I would have people focusing on uh, jumping in and addressing the friend and family level capital and angel capital. That's fantastic, Jill. There's a lot of good food for thought there. We'll be sure to return to that in the Q&A. Let me turn next to Jared. And Jared, I'd like you to talk to us, building on the foundation that Jill set, let's talk about the fundraising process a little bit, right? Um, but before we get into that, the same question to you. Take a minute or two, tell us exactly what you do day to day, tell us about Harlan Capital and how you fit into the black investor ecosystem. Sure, thanks for having me on. Um, so yeah, Harlem Capital, we are a seed stage fund focused on investing in women and minority-led companies. We were Angel Syndicate originally. Um, my business partner and I were both working at a Black-owned PE firm called ICB Partners. Saw an opportunity, um, as Jill was alluding to, for wealth creation in this space. Um, so in private equity, we look for companies generally you know, $10 million plus in EBITDA, maybe 50 plus million in revenue. We realized that ICB, which is a fantastic firm, we love them. They did a great job of keeping the family, hiring diverse folks, working with diverse third parties. When it came to investing though, no people of color at the CEO level. We had one woman the entire time uh, we were there. Um, and part of that is just systemic. You can't even get to that scale because that upstream capital, that upstream wealth creation opportunity is not there. And people are printing money left and right in these days um, if you're, you're backed by the right folks in, in growth equity or private equity. So you really wanted black folks, Latinx folks, women to be able to participate. Um, so anyway, our hands were on the ground. We really just thought that we knew 
plenty of diverse women and people of color who were starting great businesses who just had a tougher time getting funding. Uh, particularly at the earliest stages, um, it's so imperative that you have diverse investment allocators uh, because subjective, honestly, like there's only going to be so much data that you can actually bank off of, right? It's going to be more about your vision, what you're selling, the market opportunity, the industry you're in, all these things that come into play that you really do need someone empathetic who is more rooting for you than trying to stump out your idea. You can always tell an entrepreneur why I won't work. Um, so anyway, that's why we were, we're, we're doing what we are doing today. Um, so yeah, C stage firm raising uh, or investing out of a $40 million fund. We'll start raising our second fund shortly. Uh, plan to invest in 30 companies. We're usually getting in at the first or second institutional round that a company is raising. Uh, we've done 17 investments already. We invest all across the US um, and we've taken a very kind of external focus. We're, we're really pro to leveraging social media, building our brand, helps us source, helps us get great talent. Um, and so I see venture capital or we see venture capital as a wealth creation tool. If you put money in the hands of these founders at the early stages, they can grow their businesses, they'll hire diverse folks, they'll hopefully be able to create liquidity events for themselves, and they'll be able to reinvest in their communities. Um, you know, one person we like to allude to is Rich Dennis. We think what he did with Sundial and how he's reinvesting in black women has been great. Um, and then the other hand, we think we need more diverse investors. That's why we exist, but it's also why we have our diverse intern program. We've had over 52 interns, uh, over nine classes in the last two years. We are helping these very talented folks who happen to be diverse get access. Um, really, it's, it's a supply issue. It's not a demand issue. There's definitely plenty of people that are qualified to do the job. But honestly, given the limited supply, you could be as particular as you want if you're hiring someone in these roles. You can have a principal lacrosse player who's six foot two if you want every single time. Um, so what you really do need is people that have the opportunity and once they get in the door, they're able to, to fly, succeed. So that's what we're doing at Harlem Capital. It's fantastic, Jared. So, you know, Jill did a really good job setting the stage, talking about the challenges and raising your friends and family around. You know, you're taking it to the next level, looking at institutions and the things you can do as a, as a, as a, as a, as a venture capital fund to you know, change the complexion of the investors making those decisions. I want to approach it from a slightly different angle though, right? And when you talk to the limited partners, the people that are investing in your fund, and you talk to them about the challenges and the wealth gap and the difficulties getting capital to black entrepreneurs, what are you hearing from those family offices, from those pension funds? How are they thinking about investing in this asset class? And how, 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 how does that affect your conversation with them as you raise a fund? Yeah, I think it's important to note that most of our backers aren't focused on diversity. Um, that's not their core. They don't have separate buckets of capital for diverse folks. Some programs, some allocators have uh, emerging manager buckets where they happen to want to back diverse GPs, but actually looking through and backing diverse led startups is not something that most institutions are, are worried about. So from our vantage point, that's fine. Um, we think if you give us capital, that's great. And we just know the market isn't there yet. Uh, so really our backers are backing us because of our team. They're also backing our strategy, even if it's not what their strategy is, saying, hey, like we think it makes sense, go for it. And so we realized pretty early on that our capital would not come from women or people of color, most likely it's coming from ultimately the people who control most of the wealth in this country. Um, not hard to figure out who that is, but that's fine. They see us eye to eye and they really do like what we're doing. We've been able to prove with data and our sourcing pipeline, that's what exists. What I will say is things are changing um, where people are more open to it, especially after the conversations that have happened this year. Uh, we're seeing more diverse GPs raise larger funds. We're seeing on the entrepreneur side, uh, folks getting capital a little bit easier. Um, so I think things are moving in the right direction. What I think needs to change though, is folks need to think about their criteria. I think the criteria that folks are choosing really is the biggest prohibitor. So you have things that seem objective on paper that aren't objective in practice, right? Uh, so look at any type of power structure, look at any type of fund management, whether it's hedge funds, mutual funds, private equity, venture capital, 
ultimately the, the money is in the hands of, you know, 98% white guys for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, what we found is people say, hey, well, we want managers that have 15, 20 years of experience. Or we want managers that were operators before. Or we want managers that are putting up all this GP percentage. Um, all these things that, again, seem objective potentially, oh, we want people that have a track record. All these things that seem objective, but in practice, if diverse folks never got those seats at those firms, how could you have a 15, 20 year track record? It's very tough. There are maybe dozens of us that exist on the VC side. Um, and then even then, let's say you do have that track record, you're starting a fund, the math is awful if you wanna start a $50 million fund, even a $100 million fund, it doesn't make any sense. If you have 20 years of experience, you're 45 years old, the math doesn't make any sense for you. We're fortunately, uh, you know, 30 years old, so we can take a longer term view, but all these things are prohibitive and we really have been pushing our institutions to really loosen their criteria. Instead of focus on these check boxes, let's focus on what you actually need to do to be successful and how to best solve the problem, which is backing earlier stage managers who have a unique uh, go to market, but ultimately be flexible on the things that don't need to be uh, rigid criteria. Jared, I really appreciate that. And what I really liked you know, hearing you say is how you're trying to be very intentional in the data that you're collecting and making data part of the decision-making process as opposed to some more subjective criteria that don't always necessarily go in our favor, right? Um, let's turn next to Kimberly from Miami. And Kimberly's got a pretty unique perspective um, as an angel, uh, as someone who works with a major corporate, Goldman Sachs, who's investing in this space. And I'd like to you know, hear from you, Kimberly, how angels and corporates view the fundraising process. But before we do that, tell us what you do day to day and the role that you play in the ecosystem. Thanks, Joe. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here discussing one of my most favorite topics, funding Black entrepreneurs. You know, I believe diverse teams are the future and data shows they outperform. Um, I'm passionate about job creation, wealth creation, and increasing access to capital for underrepresented minority founders and investors with a personal goal to create a billion dollars of Black wealth over the next decade. So I invest with three main hats, my personal angel and fund investing. I'm a founding board member of Black Angels Miami, and I advise Goldman Sachs on launch with GS, their $500 million investing strategy in diverse teams. And all of those are with the goal of increasing access to capital and opportunities. Um, so my day-to-day, -day, it's spent with amazing founders, awesome investors, have an incredible Goldman team, and fantastic Black Angels Miami team, um, all working towards plugging you know, some of those gaps for a lot of structural and historical reasons, there's a gap along every point of the continuum for Black founders to access capital from friends and family through institutional rounds. Um, so all of my day-to-day -day work is figuring out how to create more capital, more access for funding, more opportunity um, for their ideas to succeed. That's fantastic. You know, I'm really, I'm really interested in your current role of Goldman, right? Because not many entrepreneurs would think of a major financial institution like Goldman Sachs or other banks and corporates as being a potential source of capital. Can you sort of take us behind the scenes a little bit and walk us through how a company like Goldman looks at an investment opportunity in a market like this and how they make themselves known and generate deal flow? Yeah, no, absolutely. And well before this summer, many banks had different initiatives. You know, Goldman has had launched with GS for a couple of years. JP Morgan has Advancing Black Pathways, Morgan Stanley's Multicultural Innovation Lab. Um, Citibank even launched a $150 million impact fund in January. Um, so a lot of banks were already thinking about and working on, you know, narrowing investing gaps. Um, and it's great to see more banks and large institutions now seeing the need to get to, you know, get on board and support that. Um, launch with GS specifically um, is Goldman Sachs $500 million for-profit investment strategy grounded in the data that diverse teams drive, drive strong returns. Um, we work on it through three main lenses. So investing in companies led by diverse management teams, um, partnering with clients to back investment managers, and then building an ecosystem. So the community of entrepreneurs, investors, um, and other people in this space that are also passionate about narrowing investing gaps. And I think it's really important for everyone to lean in, and in particular, these large financial institutions. You know, banks, 
are unique in that they already have a diversity lens. So these are massive institutions. They already have some diversity among their invest their among their investors versus a lot of venture funds, um, which tend to be more homogenous. And importantly, they have a breadth of resources. You know, for example, this summer Goldman welcomed 14 entrepreneurs that were selected out of 400 for their first black and latinx entrepreneur cohort and over this eight week period we were able to deploy a tremendous amount of resources from you know they were all assigned to senior goldman sachs partners they all had industry expert sessions with you know the experts in their space they all received client introductions you know the amount of resources that goldman was able to deploy to these entrepreneurs was astounding and i helped build it so um, I, was, I was really impressed by that, and I think it speaks to the role that these large institutions can play well beyond um, just investing. Fantastic insight into what large institutions do. Let's go to the opposite end of the spectrum, right, and come back to the theme I raised at the top about each of us being able to take action. What are some opportunities for individuals to help increase cap access to capital for black entrepreneurs? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, and I personally do both angel investing and LP investing. Um, there was a question submitted around um, around angels and especially like, are there any black angel lists or that sort of thing. Um, and there's, you know, there's a ton of resources around it. Um, I think angel investing is really critical for black founders because of, you know, some of the historical and systemic um, factors that limit the ability for some black entrepreneurs to raise friends and family rounds, um, like some of their peers. Um, for some of the, you know, for, in similar to angel investing, I love investing in companies. I also love investing in funds. Um, and I, I highly recommend both. From an LP perspective, if you're passionate about funding black entrepreneurs or funding diverse entrepreneurs, then you also fund diverse investors. Um, some of the research Jared and Harlem Capital put out actually, you know, show that more entrepreneurs of color are funded by investors of color. Um, and so it's really important to make sure you support those as well. Um, and I would say even beyond that, that direct investing in both companies and funds, um, it's customer introductions. You know, a company can grow, needs capital to grow, but they also need, need revenue, um, and that's huge. I would speak a little bit about Black Angels Miami, um, which I'm a founding board member down here in Miami, and just the importance of angel groups in general, um, because it increases access to capital for entrepreneurs, but it also increases access to deal flow for investors. Um, that's something I think that's, that's also important, because there are a lot of Black investors or investors of color that are interested in the early stage space but have no access to Silicon Valley deal flow. Um, and so I think, you know, when you do, when you start playing in the angel space and you get access to these types of opportunities, I think it can be wildly important and impactful. Fantastic. Thanks, Kimberly. So our final panelist, he's been extremely patient, is Greg Campbell. Greg, let's build on the points that Jill, Jared, and Kim raised about you know, additional steps that the investor community should be taking. But first, let's throw it to you, two minutes on who you are and what role you play. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, I um, am a native New Yorker and like uh, Jill, I grew up in an environment where I was surrounded by people who were basically self-employed, uh, not because of choice, but because out of necessity. That was the only employment opportunity that was uh, open to them. Um, I, I want to tell a little bit about my, my story myself because I have been both a founder and an investor. So I come to this discussion with two hats on. Um, after a career that spanned uh, a number of years uh, working in marketing and, and finance and planning, I left uh, corporate America in 1988 and I began to build companies um, in fintech and edtech, food, real estate, consulting. And then in uh, 2000, I moved out of the, uh, the founder's role and into the investor's role and founded a private equity fund, uh, the North Texas Opportunity Fund that was invested institutional capital in businesses led by uh, people of color and women uh, in, the, uh, in the Texas area. Um, I've also continued that investment uh, lifestyle with uh, serving as a partner in a merchant bank and uh, building and investing in ed tech companies throughout the United States and in South America. Um, and earlier this year, I was uh, pleased to be able to be a founder of uh, Medigini Capital uh, that's focused in, in healthcare investing. 
uh, that's headquartered adjacent to the Texas Medical Center, um, which happens to be the largest medical center in the world. Uh, and by the way, uh, very intentional when we formed Medigini uh, because we are entirely diverse. Uh, we are a GP that's made up of uh, Blacks, uh, Korean Americans, Japanese American, and Indian Americans. So we're very, very intentional in how we structured our GP so that we are going after a very, very diverse um, deal uh, sourcing structure. Um, but one of the areas that I am, you know, I spend the great amount of my time on a day-to-day -day basis and get the most amount of um, joy out of is that I have a private um, investment platform of my own called Rainmaker Inc. And that's where I build and invest in businesses that are uh, disruptive, scalable, and noble in purpose. And you won't be surprised that many of the businesses that I invest in uh, privately uh, and have been an angel investor in these deals probably going on somewhere 15 to 20 years, uh, happen to be black businesses. The businesses that I know, the businesses that I get an opportunity to mentor, support, invest in, help grow. Uh, companies that like one of our previous panelists from one of the other sessions, Mandy uh, Price with Canaries. Um, I serve as a board member for, uh, for Mandy. I am mentoring with, uh, with Mandy with a personal commitment because I think that's what it takes for us to help really grow and, and support uh, black businesses is not only the dollars invested, but the time invested. So we speak on a weekly basis. I've been so proud of what she's been able to accomplish. You know, you mentioned 50 women who have raised at least a million dollars. Well, you know, she was one of those women. She actually raised a million and a half uh, uh, dollars uh, in her initial, uh, initial raise. Um, this is uh, sort of where I get the, the most joy out of uh, life at this stage in my life of being able to work and give back to, uh, to black businesses. That's fantastic, Greg. And I, I really appreciate you mentioning Mandy in the previous session. And as I mentioned at the top, you know, Jill moderated the very first uh, session in this series. There's a lot mm -hmm. of good content out there as Regina and HAE um, uh, puts this content on the web. I encourage you to go back and check out those previous sessions. Also in the last session, another panelist was Selena Cuffey, and she's president of Magic Johnson's JV with Sodexo. And she was talking about how investors doubt Magic Johnson's abilities as a black founder still to this day. And I wanted you to take that observation, build upon your experience as a black founder, build upon you know, the points that Jill Johnson raised about the challenges that black females raise you know, that have as entrepreneurs. And let's talk about the perception issue, right? The people sitting across from you at the table and how that plays into the wealth gap. How do we get well, investors we, to address their conscious and unconscious biases when evaluating black founders? Well, we happen to live in a world where people can honestly just say, just dribble. And imagine saying that about Magic Johnson, just dribble, because that's what they believe your capabilities are. And in so many contexts, this is not really surprising. This perception impacts our ability to access capital in so many different ways. It's making real money beyond salary, you know, almost impossible to be able to get a hold of because we can't get into that network. The perception is that um, we don't somehow know how to make money. We don't have money to invest. We are not really good managers. And part of that is, I think, sort of self-imposed because we speak too often about small black businesses. And quite and, uh, actually, I'm gonna stop talking about small black businesses. I just wanna talk about black businesses. Um, I believe that there has been some very good efforts in many organizations to address hiring, uh, DEI training, um, you know, fair governance, you know, even Reverend Al coming out and, and you know, marching around. But if you don't know, hang out with you know, people who look like us and know their track record, this systematic change is going to be very, very difficult and it's gonna be very, very slow. Uh, there was a, a very wise uh, sociologist by the name of W.I. Thomas who said, if a man defines a situation as real, then it's real in all its consequences. If you don't have, um, it, have in your experience opportunities to meet and engage with black people who are doing deals and making money, then I don't believe that, they don't believe that that situation is even possible. My caveat to that is that if a man defines a situation as real, then it's real in all its consequences. 
except if it impacts their money. I go out of my way to point my angel and VC friends that don't look like me to black deals that could have, they could have or should have invested in that are scaling and are doing very successful ex exits. That's actually working for, uh, for me. Fantastic. My final question to you before we break and take audience questions, I wanted to um, build upon a question that was already submitted by a member of our audience and it's a really good one. Here it comes. You, Greg, have seen a lot in your career. Um, you've been an entrepreneur and an investor for a long time. What about this time, what about this moment really feels different? Do you believe that the renewed commitment to diversity that we're seeing in the venture community in the, wakes, in the wake of the deaths of Floyd, Taylor, and Aubrey will be long lasting? Is there something real here? I wish I could give a resounding yes, but I'm gonna give you a resounding maybe. Um, where it depends on where in the country you are, uh, what the black presence in that portion of the country it, it really is, um, and whether that person I'm dealing with is at a certain age. You know, I usually cut off of above or below 50 years old, and it, it, it addresses where that person's set of experiences have been. Do I believe that the visible killing of black people that invades our TV and our social media? on a daily purpose, a daily basis, will have long lasting uh, impact. Again, I have to give a resounding maybe. Speak to me after this election. Um, but maybe is, is dependent on steps I think that our audience can take. Power is not yielded or given um, and make no mistake that money is a surrogate of power. How do I make sure that this time it actually counts? These are the things I think I think our audience need to hear. And first and foremost is to invest in black people like your life and your future depends on it because it actually does. If you want a future for our children and our children's children, we need to have um, black successful businesses, people who can write checks to our institutions, to our politicians on an ongoing basis or else those institutions and those politicians will be beholding to somebody else besides us. Think about talking to Jill, talking to Kimberly about how do you get into an angel group? How do you form an angel group? Or how you can invest with one with you individually or, by, or with friends. The second thing I urge everybody to consider is to think bigger than you've ever thought before. I'm so freaking tired of speaking about small black business as if we're not capable of building billion dollar companies. We are. Um, I'm asking you also to step into the networks. There's alumni groups, chambers, and other organizations out there that today are more open to face, uh, to face us and engage us because of uh, Black Lives Matter and the things that have been happening over the last year. I ask you to increase your financial literacy the language of business is finance. And that's coming from a guy who was the president of the marketing club of Harvard Business School and spent much of my early career in marketing. So I've made a 180 degree turn. I've spent as much time understanding how money flows through companies and how it flows in our overall ecosystem. And then finally, make money and create generational wealth. Invest with a 50 year plan in mind. Now that sounds crazy, but that's how other groups really think about this. And quite frankly, if you think back to the folks where we came from, that's how they thought of money. They didn't think about how am I gonna make money just for myself right now? They're thinking about creating wealth, homes, land, assets over 50, hundreds of years. Build wealth as a system that will outlive you and outlive your grandkids. That's deep, man. A lot for all of us to think about. We have about 18 minutes left and I see a number of questions coming into the chat room. Please keep them coming. I wanted to start the conversation off with you know, a question I think that comes, Greg, um, somewhat in maybe slight opposition to the point you raised about getting people to think big. And I think you might have a perspective on this as well as Jill. The question is this, we talk about Main Street and black communities as being some of the first entrepreneurs and small businesses we interact with. Think your funeral parlor, think your barbershop. This person thinks that most of the funding goes to tech. 
how do we save and support Main Street and Black communities? You know, where's the money for them in the entrepreneurial ecosystem? Um, I want to take that on because I think it's very, very significant. I think you have to be able to invest in Main Street, but think about Main Street across a broad scale. Um, when I think about investing in community-based businesses, I don't want to think about investing in one funeral parlor or one bakery or one uh, bodega. I want to think about talking about investing in systems. If you go back to um, Kawasaki and the cash flow quadrant, um, you have to figure out sort of where you sit in that quadrant and where you want to invest in that quadrant. Do I want to invest in just people who are self-employed or do I want to invest in companies that have developed systems and that can scale? Because at the end of the day, like Jared, I have to come back and be able to give a return to my investors. It's very hard to gener generate a return investing in a singular business that doesn't have any scale. So yes, there is a role for investing in community-based businesses, but you have to look at those businesses and how you get them to scale. So as I'm in engaging with uh, a lot of young people and doing a lot of mentoring who, who are looking at getting into their first deal, I said, great, you're going to buy this company or you're going to you start this particular deal, but what's your goal over the next 10 years to build this into a really substantial business? Yeah, Joe, if I can just add to that, please. Um, you know, I so yes, we have a lot of small businesses that are out there, and Main Street is the lifeblood of a lot of communities, right? However, when we the problem here is that when Black people talk about small businesses, it's businesses that are barely making a hundred thousand dollars, two hundred thousand dollars. We have to get our conversation about small businesses to the $2 million, $5 million, $10 million level. Those are businesses that at least have the opportunity to create uh, strong income for those uh, entrepreneurs. And those are businesses that as well can be sold. So we still want to have that mindset of creating wealth from those businesses. And Joe, those are the businesses that can write checks. Write checks and employ people. Okay. I'll jump in right. here. Please um, go ahead, Jared. If you don't mind, or we can move Please. on. So yeah. yeah, when we started Harlem Capital, we actually wanted to invest in small businesses. So we actually did a small check in a coffee shop and a dental practice. And we found from the investment seat that the equity capital isn't well suited for these small one and two these type businesses that Greg was talking about. Mainly because you have the same failure rate as a high growth startup company. You're gonna have a 90% chance of failing. So to make it worthwhile, you have to have the upside opportunity as an invest equity investor to be able to make your return. So I think these businesses are important, even the ones that are ones and twos, but you have to get the right capital. And so for anyone that is starting a company or wants to support, you have to make sure that the capital type matches with the type of business and their growth trajectory and their margin. So for small businesses, maybe debt's better, maybe a grant's better, maybe there are type of individuals that, that want to back this type of company but if you're trying to generate outsized returns, you really have to think about either a company getting to a good growth rate with a lot of cash flow or the super VC type scale. Otherwise, the math uh, just candidly doesn't work. Um, but you know, there are a lot of ways to, to make money, but we do think that we want people thinking bigger. Um, and if you think about this year, for example, uh, the top five stocks, so the Amazon, Apple, Google, Microsoft, et cetera, they're up 60%, even despite the pandemic, right? Because they're highly scalable, don't require that much humans and have huge gross margins. The whole rest of the S&P is up, I think 1%, right? So you are seeing a shift and you have to look at not where the puck was, where the puck's going. There's been a lot of talk about, you know, investing in land and real estate, which are fundamentally okay. But for the future, you have to get to super scale. You have to be exposed or enabled by technology. Um, so that's something that we're thinking about, you know, with Harlem Capital every single day. Yeah, I spend a lot of time thinking about this too, um, particularly as an investor on the angel and venture side, but acknowledging that most companies do not have venture scale growth um, and what are some of the different funding mechanisms for them. I am very interested in some of the alternative capital models that are that are coming out as well, like revenue-based financing has been along for a while, around for a while. Melissa Bradley of 1863 Ventures does that, but Jewel Burke Solomon of Collab Capital is also doing um, profit sharing. 
And those are both like models designed for companies that will have great growth, but may show revenue and profit faster than some of the venture back companies and or just may not have that same scale of growth, but are still fun, like phenomenal companies, great fundamentals, um, and just need more capital, just not necessarily venture capital. Fantastic. No, there was Have a you? question. There, there's a question uh, about how uh, entities like Kaufman and others can get involved um, and and can support this effort. And um, I think that what Kimberly mentioned is a great place for them to get involved. Um, you know, to get involved with these companies where the return profile may not exactly be there and isn't there for venture capital or even angel investing, um, but their businesses that need investment. So that's where philanthropy could play a major role. At, Great philanthropy, but not in the form of grants. I want to be clear about that. <laughs> not in the form of grants, in the form of still uh, creating economic engines. And incentives to succeed. Cool. So we have an interesting question from Doug Zacker that I think approaches this from a slightly different lens. I wanted to throw it out there to the panel, see what they thought. And Doug asks, since one goal of funding black entrepreneurs is to close the wealth gap, right? That's what we're talking about. How much focus should be given to how these businesses will also close the income and wealth gap? How do we ensure that these businesses pay a living wage, purchase from black owned vendors, provide comprehensive health benefits? You know, is it worth taking a more holistic and systemic approach to how these businesses operate in addition and above and beyond just give, giving them capital to start? And should investors be looking at those metrics? I can actually take a first, um, I'll make a first comment on that, which is when investing in diverse founders and investors, the same as you invest in anyone, I try not to put any requirements on them that I would not ask of anyone else. Um, one place this shows up is if you are investing, or that I've seen it show up, is if you are investing in, say, a Black venture capitalist, and then you want to know if they're asking their portfolio companies, you know, do they have a certain number of Black employees or so on and so forth. And try, I try to avoid, and I think like general practice is to try to avoid putting any additional requirements on a Black founder or a Black investor that you wouldn't put on any other investor in your portfolio. That's a really good point. Anybody else want to jump in? If not, well, we have a few more. Well, ahead, she, she, she said exactly what I was going to say. And I'll just add to that. If we really want to make a difference there, we should be asking every other company that right. question. So <laughs> Kimberly, I'm just so glad you said that because I feel like often uh, what's asked of black entrepreneurs is, well, what's your social impact? You know, what are you doing for the community? Well, you know, what? if you make a lot of money and you get really wealthy and that wealth is then uh, spread throughout the community and benefits the community, that is the social impact. I, I couldn't have said that better, Jill. I, I think we do overburden sometimes our, our black businesses by insisting that they have to you know, hire the people, whether they're skilled or not, pay them, whether they, you know, above average um, wages, et cetera. We want to build successful, large black businesses. And out of that, uh, that ecosystem will come the wealth for the rest of the community because black businesses tend to employ more black people. Uh, they tend to help make other black people have opportunities where they can move up in those organizations and spin off other black entrepreneurs. That's the goal. And I think if we can get really focused on the goal, and that is building more and more black businesses that are five, 10, 15, 20, $100 million, we'll be very, very successful as a community. Greg, your earlier point about, you know, thinking about entire systems as opposed to you know, one-off companies. David Roberts from the audience raises an interesting question as well, again, for the, for, the, for the entire group. And he asks, is there a need or an opportunity to create a black equivalent of TIE? And TIE stands for the Indus Entrepreneur. Uh, it's, it's a coalition that was founded by Indian business people to mentor, educate, and fund ventures started by other Indian entrepreneurs. Very strong in Silicon Valley where I'm based. So now half the startup businesses in the Valley founded by Indian entrepreneurs, there are 61 chapters. They funded over 10,000 ventures. Is there an opportunity here to create an organization or if one exists, you know, let's, let's elevate it on this call that can provide a lower risk investment opportunity for successful black investors who may not be experienced in business, entertainers, athletes, and allies. 
is there is is there a platform to be built here? I, I think there is a platform to be built, and quite frankly, you know, when I go back and look at my early childhood, growing up in in um, South Jamaica, Queens, uh, there was a community of folks that you know helped each. Uh, family with the whatever businesses they were involved in. Um, we didn't have a formal name for it, but it, it, it existed. Um, I like to think about that as uh, maybe micro angel investing, um, where we just organize it in a different way to do that. Uh, you know, if you, if you study um, societies, in, particularly in West Africa, that exists there. If you think through the Caribbean, it exists there. If you go into Canada and talk with Black people in Canada, it exists there. Um, is it widespread in the United States? No. Should it be? Yes. Um, there is ways to do it and it's a, it's a pay into the system and be able to get out of the system on an ongoing basis. And that's something that we should consider. Fantastic. Jill, Greg, Kimberly, I think you know, Jared, here's another good question from Al Coleman, right? How do we better teach building of wealth systems within the black community? when most public funding programs are geared towards self-employed businesses, you think federal, you know, local, the SBA loan program, or, you know, local regional economic development, economic insistence. How do you go about building systems as opposed to individual businesses? Well, I'll start this. Jill knows this is one of my favorite topics. It's called about building um, systems that focus in on equity as opposed to debt. Um, we said earlier that, we, are, we, have a, we have about 10% of the net worth of the majority community in our communities. I think $17,000 for our community, $171,000 for uh, the white community is net worth. Um, we don't have the money to do the friends and family round to start and sustain and, and help lift businesses. If we don't have that and we are continually trying to say, well, you know, get it from your friends and family, use your credit cards, and then we wind up with, you know, jack, you know, credit, uh, not able to get loans, et cetera. What we really need is a systematic approach to be able to return equity into early stage companies that are led by people of color, because we don't have that in our communities. Without that, we're not going to be successful. So if there's anything that I can urge us as a policy matter to look at, it is to think through how we create systematic uh, funds that can invest equity back into early stage companies. And this is really an area too where opportunity zones could be used. Right now, a lot of the investment is going into real estate. However, there is a component for businesses. And I really think that the original uh, concept around opportunity zones was around businesses. And so, you know, I, I would urge people again who want to um, do something. Uh, to take a look at the available vehicles that we have and the, the instruments that we have um, to get this done and to make Opportunity Zones uh, a, a way, a channel through which to actually invest in businesses. Fantastic. I'm smiling here because I see, oh, sorry, go ahead, Greg. Or Jared, I'm just going to say, yeah. um, Jill, you know, Jill is aware of, there's, a, there's a, a fund that's actually a very successful VC fund that's actually making a very creative use of uh, the Opportunity Zone program. They're actually putting together $300 million um, and investing in platform companies in a black community. Um, and uh, they're going through life sciences, uh, food, um, ed tech, and uh, health tech. Uh, and they're building a series of platform companies that are going to be located in the black community um, funded within that community, employing people from that community, and uh, hopefully will eventually be uh, liquidated and taken public within that community. Fantastic. Two quick things I'll add. I think there is a, a huge opportunity for crowdfunding. Um, so I think crowdfunding as a way to make money, I'm skeptical of, but crowdfunding as a way to get capital to companies, I'm actually very supportive of. So I think that like, using a technology platform to get people information, aggregate capital really quickly, I think could be really beneficial and decrease some of the friction and some of the manual processes that could prohibit someone from getting money. I would also say we spent a lot of time around fund managers and I do think we need to do something to hook the critical mass people that have been successful financially managing money and get them kind of unified to support black companies. 
because a lot of their strategies don't in their main business evolve around investing in diverse folks. If you think about any of the top folks, very few of them are actually investing strategically intentionally in diverse folks. But if you can't get them to adjust their main business, maybe getting them to support a strategy or a separately managed pool of capital that is dedicated for minorities. I would love to see that. Um, I think, you know, my generation will do better, but the folks that are Gen X, baby boomers that are currently in control, I would love to see them do more and get a coalition around getting capital uh, to diverse folks. I love it. I love it. We have two minutes left, time for one more question. I'm smiling because I see a question come from Chantel Williams, my mentee. What's up, Chantel? Good to see you on here. She's asking a question, I think, for Jared and Kimberly. This is right up your alley. Now, Kimberly, I'll give you last word. Question is, with so much current interest in investing in black entrepreneurs, I see a need to find investors that Jared, as you mentioned, are empathetic. What are some best practices founders can use to evaluate potential investors and ensure they are committed to the founder's long-term success and vision? Jared, start. Kimberly, finish. Go ahead. I'll go ahead and pass it to Kim. I know we only have two minutes left. But I guess just, just building relationships. I mean, in this, in this COVID environment, I mean, it's harder just to you know, serendipitously meet people. Uh, but I think there's a bunch of events and platforms that make it easier. What I'll say is social media has been incredible. I think we over index for it and it's so powerful. Like LinkedIn has been great for building relationships. Twitter even is really good, especially on the technology side. And what I'll say is there's a ton of people of color that are hosting events. So I would love to see us not reinvent the wheel and do things in silos. I would love to see more aggregation. Uh, I think that's definitely a strategy, at least for VC. There's a group called Black VC, which is connecting all these different black professionals at different VC firms. So I think focusing on aggregation and making it one stop shop rather than having these bunch of events with 20 attendees, having more massive scale things where people can actually interact with each other, I think would be great. And I do think Launch is doing a great job with that. I think Techstars, while diversity isn't a strategy, they're doing a good job, at least on diversifying their pool. So I think getting plugged into those things could be pretty good avenue. Fantastic. Um, thanks, Jared. And Chantel, that's a really great question. One of the concerns actually that we see is suddenly, you know, investors that have never cared about and may still not care about investing in black founders have suddenly decided that they want to either raise funds or allocate more capital or that sort of thing. And so to the part of your question that asked about how do entrepreneurs um, evaluate these investors, one of the best ways is through references um, and talking to the other founders that those investors have invested in. Um, we strongly encourage, um, I encourage my founders and at Goldman, we encourage our launch with GS founders to do that. And a lot of those investors can also provide kind of reference checks on some of the investors too. Fantastic. Thanks, Kimberly and Jared for your answers. And to Greg, Jared, Kimberly, Jill, thank each of you, all of you for spending time with us today. And Regina and Annabelle and the rest of the team, thank you for your vision, your dedication and your support in bringing us together. We're coming up on time now, so I wanted to make sure that we respect everybody's time and, and to each of you in the audience for spending an hour with us today and your interest and most importantly, your action. We all wanted to extend our thanks to you as well. Remember, in six months, March 2021, we'll be reconvening and taking stock to see what has changed over the past half year period. Don't forget to check out HAE's website at harvardae.org and see their other events and programming that Regina and the team have lined up. And if you're a Harvard alumnus and not yet a member of this amazing community, please don't wait any longer. There are a lot of benefits from free events to exclusive membership programs to our very own HA Connect platform will be available once you join. So thank you very much for your time today. It's been a true pleasure. And hopefully you got as much out of this as, as I did. Thanks to everybody.